Okay. Well, thanks everybody. I'm so glad we could uh, get our science accountability and equity working group together today to talk about the National Assessment of Educational Progress, um, NAGB, and the National Assessment Governing Board, and the, the NAEP assessment or something that, that there's varying degrees of familiarity with in our community, and they're very important tools as we sort of look at the interaction of how, how um, testing and assessment drive behavior and knowledge of the, the conditions that are going on in the field and sort of the changes that are evoked by the, the, the pending future changes of, of NAEP in general around science, but also the trends in the assessment world generally. So um, without further ado, I'm going to get um, to our two speakers today. First is Dr. Christine Cunningham, a senior vice president for STEM learning at the Mu Museum of Science in Boston, a member of the National Assessment Governing Board, also a faculty member at Penn State University. I had to get that in. And uh, we also are joined by Dr. Sharon Rosenberg, who's Assistant Director for Assessment Development at the National Assessment Governing. So let me um, let me turn it over to you briefly, Christine and Sharon, and I will pull up the slides while you're uh, you're sort of starting things off. Just you know, say some welcomes and anything else you want to do in the way of introductions, and then we'll go around the room here and let everybody else introduce themselves. Wonderful. Well, thanks for having us here today. Um, as uh, was mentioned, my name is Christine Cunningham, and I serve on the National Assessment Governing Board. But um, immediately when I was um, asked to join you folks today, uh, inquired as to whether I could bring a real expert in, and that is Sharon Rosenberg. So she has graciously agreed to join us as well because she is actually on staff. Um, at the National Assessment Governing Board and knows more about NAEP and the history than I could ever hope to know. So she's going to also be here um, as questions come up and to help set the some of the larger context for the science assessment and the science framework um, because it does uh, fit inside a much uh, bigger set of assessments that's governed by all kinds of um, regulations I have learned on my time on the board, um, but we are super excited to be sharing our newest uh, framework today um, that focuses on science. But before we do so, um, I'll pass it over to Sharon in case you want to say anything, and then I'd love to learn a little bit more about who's on the call. Thanks, Christine. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sharon Rosenberg. I um, staff the Assessment Development Committee on the board, and Christine is our vice chair. Um, I'm a psychometrician by training, but I'm not a science content expert, although I did learn a lot by going through the recent uh, science framework update, um, but I'm happy to uh, be here and tell you a little bit about Nate. Well, so let's go around the room um, before you share the slides where everybody can still be on more or less one screen. So Peter, why don't you go first? Um, Peter R. Uh, I'm Peter Reinthal, president of Ronico and a professor at the University of Arizona. Kevin? Evan Anderson, Science and STEM STEAM Education Coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Peter M. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, Peter McLaren, Executive Director for Next Generation Science Standards. Thank you. Katie. Katie Sherry here as the Chair of the Commission on P-12 Engineering Education for American Society of entering education. Martha. Senior Vice President for Community Partnerships at Project Lead the Way and listening in for our um, on behalf of our assessment team. Jeremy. I am Jeremy LeBlanc, Channel Partner Manager with uh, AccuScope or a microscope uh, dealer based out of New York. Heath. Hi, I'm Heath Wings. I'm with the American Chemical Society. Austin. Hello, Austin Hall, uh, Director of Policy with the STEM Education Coalition. Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Shugart, the CEO of the National Science Teaching Association. Kimberly. Hi, Kimberly Hughes. I'm the Director of the UTeach Institute, supporting a national network of colleges and universities preparing middle and high schools. Alex. Alex Mlinich, President of Aldon and Chair of the Hands-On Science Partnership. Jody. Hi, Jody Peterson. I'm a consultant with uh, Bose Public Affairs. Jimmy. 
Hi, Jimmy Pinozo, um, National Sales Manager at O House Corporation. Olga? Hi, I'm Olga Vargas, CMO of Vernier Science Education. Della? Della Cronin uh, with Bose Public Affairs Group. Steve? Steve Heyer, Student Association for STEM Advocacy. John W. Uh, John Wheeler, uh, VP of Innovation at Vernier Science Education. Charlie. Hi, I'm Charlie Thompson. I'm a Research and Policy Associate at the Learning Policy Institute. Uchenna. Hi, everyone. Uchenna Zibe. I'm the Senior Manager of STEM Programs at the American Nuclear Society. Celeste. Hi, Celeste Belay, Market Development Manager for Fisher Science Education, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific, and Vice Chair of POSP. Thomas O. We'll come back to you, Thomas. Lacey? I am Lacey Sarnelli. I'm Senior Manager of Product Portfolio Management at Fisher Scientific, a part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. Amy? Hi, everyone. Amy Lohr. I'm Senior Director of Government Relations for Project Lead the Way. Shane? Hello. Shane Woods, Executive Director for Girl Start. And I don't see anybody else I haven't recognized, but if there is anybody, let me just pause for a minute and let you introduce yourself. Okay, great. All right, let me pull up the presentation here. Oh, sorry. It always gets hidden behind the little screen. All right. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Take it away. Um, okay. So I'm going to start with some overview about NAEP. If you can just advance a couple of slides, and then I will turn it over to Christine to tell you more about science and NAEP specifically. Okay, great. Um, so NAEP is actually a congressionally mandated assessment. There is uh, an actual NAEP law, and I'm going to tell you about some of the specific things in the legislation, including um, it, uh, it lays out some um, qualities of NAEP and responsibilities of the governing board and our partners, NCES, the National Center for Education Statistics, um, but one of the things in the legislation is that NAEP is to be given at grades 4, 8, and 12. And so, for example, we got this, this has come up in regard to science about why is it grade 4 and not grade 5? And the, the answer to that question is that it is actually in the legislation. Um, each student that is randomly sampled for NAEP takes only a small portion of the full assessment. So NAEP is pretty different from state assessments in this way both in terms of not all students take NAEP. It's a random sample of, um, of, of schools within, and a random sample of students within sampled schools. And then students who are selected only take about one hour of assessment time. So then the results for the different forms across the different students are, are aggregated together to come up with the group level results that are reported. So when you see NAEP results, you'll see national results. Sometimes you will see state and district level results as well. You will see re um, results for groups of students, but you will never see results for individual students or schools because that is prohibited by law. Uh, it's not supported by the design either, but it is also specifically prohibited by the legislation. Um, NAEP reports both scale score. Oh, sorry, I have a little oh, bit sorry. more on that. Uh, little, NAEP reports both scale scores and the percentage of students reaching the NAEP achievement levels, which are NAEP basic, NAEP proficient, and NAEP advanced. Um, and NAEP is also known as the nation's report card. You can go to the next slide. So here I'm just uh, laying out a little bit about how the program is organized. So as I mentioned, there, there is actually legislation for NAEP. Um, 
The National Assessment Governing Board sets policy for NAEP and the board members are appointed by the Secretary of Education. And then the NCES um, oversees all of NAEP operations. So doing the item development, administering the assessment, analyzing and reporting results, et cetera. And both the Governing Board and NCS have many contractors that um, support both policy and operations. Okay. You, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, so in turn, these are the some of the responsibilities of the governing board that are in the legislation. Um, and I, I bolded the ones that are the two that really are related to what we're talking about today. So two of the main responsibilities are to determine the assessment schedule, which means what is tested and when and at what levels. So for example, for science, the board determines um, whether it should be at the uh, national level only or when it should be at the state level, how often it is given, et cetera. Um, and the board has the responsibility of developing the assessment frameworks, which determine what content appears on the assessment. Um, we have 26 members. The legislation is very specific about the categories of membership, including um, governors or former governors, state legislators, teachers, principals, et cetera. Um, and Christine actually is in a category that I don't have up here, that, which is curriculum specialist. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, in terms of the assessment schedule, the legislation actually requires that for reading and math only, um, they are required to be administered every two years for grade four and eight at the national and the state level, and every four years for grade 12 at the national level only. Um, in addition to that requirement, we have 27 large urban districts, or we, we call them the Trial Urban District Assessment, or TUDA, that um, have opted to participate on a voluntary basis to get score reports for their districts. Um, other subjects, including science, are administered to the extent that budget allows. And when they are administered, um, when there is an option for states or district to participate, it is voluntary. So um, when we offer this, um, states do not have to participate by law, but they can choose to participate when we have that option. Uh, the board has a goal of administering science every at least every four years and at the state and district level whenever possible. Um, but some of this is driven by budget constraints. Uh, most recently, NAEP science was assessed at all three grades in 2019, but only at grade eight in 2024. And the, the assessment window just recently closed. So those results will not be released until sometime um, next year. Karen, do you report which states participate? Um, the last time we did science at the state level, almost all states actually participated. Uh, what we do have it on the schedule uh, for 2028 at grade eight at the state level, and that would remain, you know, it's way too early for us to know at this point um, who might choose to participate in that assessment so, since it's still several years away. Um, but when when we had offered state level science in the past, oh my, I think it was forty seven states. Almost all states had chosen to participate. Yeah. Um, so the assessment frameworks, uh, which lay out what is to be covered on the assessments, um, they're developed through a really comprehensive, inclusive, and deliberative process. This is not just the board sitting down and like off the cuff coming up with something about what should be assessed. It's a multi-year process that um, involves many, many different people. We, we do it through panels of experts. We have several opportunities for public comment. Now we're doing that both at the beginning of the process to ask people what they think should be updated. And when we have a draft of the document, and I, I do recognize several of your names um, from participating in that process. So this is probably not new. Um, to everyone, but we just recently went through this process uh, that wrapped up a few months ago 
Um, and Christine will talk a little bit more about the actual content, but the, the frameworks, they, these are assessment frameworks. So this is about what should be on the assessment, what should be measured, how it should be measured, um, how, what should be, uh, what kind of skills and knowledge should be needed to rate to reach the NAEP achievement levels. Um, again, we're prohibited by law from telling states and districts what to teach or what to include on their own local assessments. So sometimes people do choose to look to NAEP for inspiration, um, but that is different than us um, coming out and saying, we are putting this on the NAEP assessment because we think you should be doing X, Y, and Z. Um, the other thing that is important is, you know, NAEP is a large scale assessment. So there are just some constraints on, um, on, on what can be assessed in that context. And then finally, uh, it's a pretty long process from adopting a framework until it is actually administered on an operational assessment. So um, it typically takes the entire cycle about four or five years. So the board adopted the updated science framework at the end of 2023, and it's being implemented in January of 2028. So that is about, um, it's a little over four years. And the reason for that is that um, there is a pretty extensive process of writing new items, trying out those items, but first in cognitive labs, they go through, items go through a lot of different expert reviews for content accuracy, for bias, for, you know, all, all sorts of different things, including the governing board reviews all the items. There is a lot of pilot testing that goes on to make sure you know students are responding to the assessment the way we think they should be, um, and and all of that is done before items are put on the operational assessment. So when when the operational assessment is finally produced, um, each student receives first there there are some directions and a tutorial, and then two what we call cognitive blocks, which is about 30 minute uh, sections of items um, uh, followed by a questionnaire. The, there are questionnaires for students who take the assessment and for the teachers and schools of the sampled students to provide some information about um, opportunity to learn, teacher background, resources at the school, things like that, that help contextualize um, the results. So I do see one question about whether the assessments are uh, equated over time. Um, in general, yes. With the new framework that we just adopted, it might, it might be the case that it is so different from previous frameworks that we may need to start a new trend line. Um, that is something that, um, we, we try to avoid when possible, but in this case, the board decided that it was more important to update the framework to the extent um, needed to reflect what is, what is happening in the field, even if it means that, that we may not be able to um, continue the trend line. So that remains to be seen, um, but is not a guarantee in this, in this case. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Christine to tell you more, more about the science um, assessment and framework specifically. Great. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to first describe some of the key features of the current NAEP science framework. So th this framework has guided the NAEP assessments from 2009 through the most recent and last data collection under this framework, which just concluded, as Sharon said, um, this year in 2024. Um, so that framework um, includes three content areas and four scientific practices. Um, but these practices are conceptualized differently from how we currently are talking about practices in the field. Um, and you'll see that's one of the things that in this framework, we updated it um, for the new framework that will be implemented for our next assessment, which will take place in 2028. So we are now as a committee and um, a governing board moving past, we'll report on the 2024 um, results next early next year, um, but we are all focusing our efforts on the 2028 um, uh, assessment and framework. So this current framework, the one that went through 2024, 
um, includes different types of items, including selected response, which might be multiple choice or matching, and also some constructed response where students are actually writing uh, some text. There are also individual items, but also some interactive computer tasks or scenario-based tasks and hands-on tasks. So we have a variety of different kinds of item tasks. So I'm gonna show you a few items that have been released to the public from the current assessment to give you an idea of what the current framework and assessment items look like. So next slide. So this sample item is an example of a grade four multiple choice item. Next slide. This is a grade eight item. So it's a slightly different type of selective response where students are dragging and dropping their answers um, into the box. Next slide. Um, this is an example of a grade eight item that has multiple parts. So one is a selected response and one is a constructed response. And then finally, this is an example of a single grade 12 item that is actually part of a larger scenario-based task. So there's a scenario that's set up and then a task character you see here in the upper left walks the student through a set of steps asking questions along the way. And each of these questions is scored as a separate test item. Next slide. This one we included as an example of how you can use data from the contextual questionnaires to interpret the results. So in 2019, we found, not surprisingly, that students who attend schools that have laboratory facilities for 12th grade science scored significantly higher than students who attended schools without such facilities. So after they've done all the science questions, as Sharon mentioned, there's a set of questions where we try to get some uh, what we call contextual data so we can understand a little bit more about the students' experiences. And we also have a, a survey that the teachers do. Next slide. This slide shows us the NAEP science results for grade eight from 2009 to 2019. So the scores in 2019, which had a mean of 154, are significantly higher than 2009, but you'll see there has not been a lot of change. Um, and the average score overall is lower than the NAEP proficient achievement level, which one of those little dotted lines in the middle, which is the bar indicating competency over challenging subject matter. So we as a nation, are not yet scoring proficient on our um, science report card for science. Next slide. So as uh, Sharon mentioned, a few years ago, our board began the process of updating the NAEP science assessment framework since the version that we are currently using had been adopted in 2005. So it was important to us that we made changes to reflect the current state of research and of practice. Next slide. The NRC framework for K-12 science education was used as one of the most important foundations for this update. Um, the new framework is different from the previous NAEP framework in several important ways that you can see here, um, beginning with the definition of science achievement, which I'll let you read there. Um, I will also briefly discuss the key differences in terms of the dimensions of science, the assessment design, and the reporting. Next slide. Oops. So the new, the 2028 science framework describes the three dimensions and requires that all items on the assessment measure at least the first two dimensions and cross-cutting concepts are indicated when possible. So every item on the test has to have a disciplinary concept and a science and engineering practice to be included on the assessment. And when we can fit in cross-cutting concepts um, in a way that makes sense, um, those will be included as well. Next slide. 
Uh, the new framework also has a much greater emphasis on phenomenon and contexts. So item types will include selected response and constructed response. And we're going to do this in oftentimes in sets that are based on a common stimulus. So the students have a context against which they are answering their questions. So there will be also some scenario based tasks in addition to static items. In the new framework, uh, we call for an in equal distribution of items across all three disciplinary areas, life science, earth science, and physical science at grade four, eight, and 12. The current framework has variation across these um, by grade. So that is a change. Um, we've also developed a complexity framework to describe how to make items within a disciplinary area more or less complex to ensure that an assessment can be created that measures the full range of student performance. And one of the conversations we've been having a lot on the board is that we need more questions that assess at the lower part of the scale because we have so many students who are clustered down um, in the bottom 10 or 25%. So we're trying to really make sure that our assessments um, can speak to those students as well. And then finally, the framework is calls for a, a diverse phenomenon and contexts that reflect a variety of student backgrounds and experiences. Okay, next slide. So in terms of how we'll then report these data, once we'll have to go from the framework, as Sharon said, then we'll actually design the test through a very complicated process and we'll get to read these items many, many times um, as part of the assessment development committee. But once they're out and they've been administered, um, we've already started talking about how those scores will be reported. So there will be an overall score of science achievement in addition to a subscale for sense making in physical science, sense making in life science, and sense making in earth and space sciences. Um, however, the disciplinary concepts, practices, and cross cutting concepts will not be reported separately. So it'll just be that larger umbrella um, that we report upon. Um, the framework also includes updated achievement level descriptions that indicate what science students should be able to know and should, what they should be able to do to reach our descriptions of NAEP basic, NAEP proficient, and NAEP advanced um, at each of the tested grade levels, so 4, 8, and 12. And then finally, um, we spent some time thinking in the framework about areas of emphases for some new contextual variables. And part of this um, discussion has been about assessing students' opportunity to learn. So we can start to pull some of that into uh, the analyses that we do, or that others do. Okay, next slide. So I'll show you a couple um, examples from sample examples. These, of course, have not been used because the framework or the assessments have not been developed. But to give you a sense of sort of how the new test items will look different, from some of the current test items. Here's an example for grade eight. Um, and so this is a complicated setup. It has some reading. Um, there's one question listed at the bottom here, but in reality, after the students have sort of understood that context, there would be multiple questions. So once they, they have that phenomenon, they understand the context, then there'd be a series of questions that they ask related to that reading. So this is a fourth, uh, an eighth grade uh, question. Next slide. Um, this is a sample item that would be for 12th grade, and you're going to see this twice. So we're going to we um, are showing you some of the differences in how we can make an item more or less complex. So at the bottom here, um, this would be an example of a very uh, uh, more simple or less complex item where the students are dra just dragging um, the appropriate boxes to represent um, the flow um, below. But if you click to the following slide, you'll see an intermediary um, uh, level of complexity. So in this case, not only are they dragging the boxes, but they're also dragging the arrows. And in fact, there's a third um, example that's even more complex than this. We didn't include um, in the slide deck uh, that would be even more complex. So depending upon um, a variety of factors, there's some different levels of complexity that um, measure what students can do. Um, Okay, so that's the general overview. We thought we would give you some time for questions today about what might be helpful for you and um, what more would uh, you'd like to know about what we know about the 
both either current or upcoming science framework. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Cher. Very much appreciated. This is uh, the first. Th that's the most um, the most information I've seen on NAEP um, in one place, and it's it it it's really interesting. And it raised a couple of questions that I I'll start off, and I'm sure there'll be some questions from the group. Let me start with a couple of simple ones. What does it cost to administer the NAEP science assessment? Sharon? Yeah, that, that is not a straightforward question. Um, because it, The answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> depends on many things, including um, uh, whether it's all three grades, whether it's at the net, it's much more expensive to administer the assessment at the state and district level than at the national level. It actually also depends on what else is in the field. It, you know, when science is administered at the same time as reading and math, there's efficiencies. We go, we typically go to the same schools. We just sample more students and some take science and some take reading and math. So, um, I don't think we have publicly released, not, it is in the many millions every, every time we have an administration, um, but I, I don't think we actually have publicly released numbers um, or, you know, it, it really does depend on, on a lot of uh, different factors, but it, it's, NAEP does right now, we do send um, test administrators and equipment into the school. So it, it's no, NAEP has been known as a drop from the sky assessment. We try to make it as easy as possible for schools to participate, to get in, you know, for the administrators to come get in and out. Um, uh, and, and, but that does, that does add to the, to the cost as well. Well, and one other question. So I see you've got your hand up there, Peter. Um, what does the experience look like to a student? In other words, does a student know, hey, we're going to do the NAEP science assessment on Wednesday this week, and do they know they're picked? Do they, you know, do, do they know they're taking the NAEP assessment? Like, how do you sample the, how do, who decides who gets picked? Yeah, they do know. Um, NCES handles this. They, they um, oversee and implement all of the sampling. So, it's done based um, the, on a, a sampling frame of all schools in the nation, and schools are randomly uh, schools are randomly selected, and um, rosters are provided. So the school cannot say these are the thirty students we want to participate, and there are thirty highest achieving students. Um, the NCS and their contractors actually get lists from from students of students in the sample schools and they notify the schools of which students are selected for the assessment. So students are um, and parents are aware that students were sampled um, uh, for for the assessment. So, so it would be something on the order of, hey, your student has been selected to take the NAEP science assessment on some dates, or Okay. All right, Peter, your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation, Sharon and Christine. Very informative. Um, I, I was interested, and it seems that this, this happens all the time, but um, I normally wear a T-shirt that says, I heart cross-cutting concepts. Um, and I'm interested in the fact that you're looking for sense making the three domains, and yet the cross cutting concepts seem to get a short shrift sometimes. Yet it is probably the dimension that really helps students make sense out of scenarios. So, is there or are there any conversations and ways in which to incorporate the cross cutting concepts more consistently? so that you would have a more um, even playing field as far as how the students are answering the, the questions and using the three dimensions, truly using the three dimensions. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, um, I can jump in for that one. So there were lots of conversations about how these three dimensions would play out on the exams. And I think part of the challenge was particularly as we look at the more um the simpler side of the questions that aren't so complex it's challenging to get two dimensions into many of those questions and i think a lot of the folks on the framework panel thought it would be you know basically 
not a simple question anymore if we then add a third dimension in there. So there was much vigorous debate about keeping even two in there. There were there were some folks who advocated that we needed to just have some questions with just one, and that was not how the final um, a, a recommendation was made. So I think the idea is that you want to have as many as possible, but they felt that telling the developed Mint folks that all three have to be in every question on the assessment would make for an exam that was just not able to be developed or at least able to be developed in a framework where you had some, you know, simple questions and some more complex questions. Um, we also, as I mentioned, at this point in time, um, won't be able to report anything individually about the cross-cutting concepts or the engineering practices. So we could only report on the scales currently. The only ones that are there are about sort of sense making as a whole. So yes, short cross cutting concepts is getting a little bit of the short shrift. Um, I I believe there will be mapping the as they do the assessments. They will have you know a back end looking at where things are to try to make sure that they are um, the students are going across the the different concepts there are. But they just could they didn't the assessment committee or the development committee did not feel like they could recommend that all three of them would be on every single item. Just May I just follow up on that really quickly? Mm -hmm. And you make perfect sense. It's incredibly, incredibly difficult to do a standalone question with three dimensions in it. Right. However, um, in some of the work that I've been doing, some of the work I've been seeing, uh, the cross-cutting concepts uh, are best used a lot of times as a stimulus, as a transition from a scenario to having students even do a two-dimensional question where it's a practice and, a, and the content. It's the idea of getting the students to be able to think in terms of the aspect of the cross-cutting concept when answering the question. So um, I'm, I'm encouraged and I hope that the conversation still continue in terms of more meaningful inclusion of yeah. the cross-cutting concept. Thank you for your explanation. Yeah. And I would say if you have, one of the things that the um, development the assessment or framework development committee did do is look really hard to try to find examples of existing assessments of this type. There's, you know, assessments that are sort of local or in a classroom. But if you know of examples that are do or assessments that are doing a good job that have, have published articles about it, we they and we are now sort of combing the literature to find that because these three dimensions are new. And although some states are, you know, doing some baby steps around assessing the three dimensions, it's still, there's still not a whole lot out there. And so anything you know of or any places you can point us, uh, I think would be super helpful for the folks who are developing these assessments. So Christine, you, you, um, I forget whether, yeah, it was, you, you mentioned you're collecting the information about does your 12th grade school have lab, sufficient laboratory reason. I forget the exact wording of the, the question was, but do you have a laboratory basically was the question. What else do you ask in that respect in terms of like the 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 other contextual questions about what resources are available? And is that information something that we on the outside can see? Do you report that in the findings? How does that how does that fit in? Okay. I I I lost you a little bit in the middle, but I think you were asking about the contextual questions. Is that correct? Well, so I, one of the slides talked about how a school with, la you asked oh, them, do yeah. you have laboratories? If the answer is yes, then the performance is better, right? What else do you ask that's in that same, in that same spirit in terms of the conditions of the school? And is any of that information reported publicly afterwards or is that is that internal to NCES? Yeah, so I'll start with the second one. Um, my understanding, and Shannon, Sharon, correct me if I'm wrong, is that any of the information that is collected in the contextual questions is available um, for the outside world. So what we encourage is other researchers to use our the data that we collect to do research. Like NAGB does not itself um, conduct research. We present some results, but we don't actually do some of the research um, around that. And so there are many academics around the country who um, can get the data in various kinds of ways. Some of it's downloadable online. I think other ones, there might be some um, some arrangements. Uh, so none of the data is like secret. It's considered data that's supposed to be used by folks. Um, there's a variety of questions and we're in the process for the next year of um, thinking about how we might bolster some of that. So there's 
questions about, you know, Sharon, again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know all the details of the current assessment, but they might ask students like how many times a week they have science, whether they do hands-on science. They'll ask teachers questions about their background and what they've um, done. We can't, again, we're not reporting anything individual, but individually, but the goal is to be able to, to um, understand the results in some context. Now, that said, something that I have learned sitting on this board is that you run into really quickly um, a, a uh, mandate that we are not allowed to collect any information that has anything to do with recommendations about curriculum. And they and many times define curriculum extremely broadly, in my personal opinion. Um, and so, and not every state, um, you don't have to administer the the contextual items. Again, Sharon, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure there are states that either strongly push back or, you know, have the option of opting out of that. So we are trying to think about as we move forward how we can collect some of the really important, in my mind, those contextual variables. And this is Christine Cunningham speaking, not Nagby. Um, the contextual variables are where we can start to understand where systems or um, the country can um, have levers to potentially change um, what students are able to do, students' achievement. And so to the degree that we can collect those kinds of data, like do you have labs? Do you have, you know, what sort of instruction are you getting absent curriculum? What kind of instruction are you getting? How is that instruction happening? Is it happening every single day? It is it happening in block scheduling. The more we can get that kind of information, the more we'll be able to um, at least correlate that, nothing's causal, but correlate where we see students who are performing strongly and where we're not. So it is an uh, emphasis, as um, I mentioned, of this new exam, we are trying to think really carefully about how do we collect um, different types of data, potentially, that allow us to get that kind of information without crossing over some of the lines that um, are ex that exist about what we're able and not able to talk. And I'll ask Sharon, do you want to add anything else? Because I know you've you've been more involved in contextual variable stuff than I have across the various exams. No, just I put in the chat the link to where you can find all of the NAEP questionnaires for all of the subjects and types and great, you know, so those are all public what what was asked. And then um, I also put a link to the NAEP data explorer. You can do your own analyses in addition to the ones that are on the, you know, SNAP uh, summary reports. Um, you can go in and, and run some of your own analyses and look for you know results by additional contextual variables if, if you would like. So we do record everything. This well, and is there, when you, when you put together the plan for the, the forthcoming assessment, the next one, is, is that the kind of information where you would say, hey, here's our plan for what we plan to collect in terms of what I'll call the non-learning related data, the, the contextual information? Is that something where you know, our community could, could provide some recommendations on what we'd like you to collect? Um, potentially, I need to uh, talk to NCS about their process. So there has been a lot of input, you know, from the framework committee, they provided general recommendations. And then there there um, are a lot of um, reviews that 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 go on in between. I'm not sure I, I certainly can um, put you in touch with the people that oversee that process and see what opportunities there might be for you to provide input. Sure. Thank you, thank you. Katie? Thanks, uh, thank you for your presentation. My questions are around one, the sort of literacy component and having questions that extend from DCIs to SEPs and maybe CCCs, how do you, I noticed that the sample items you showed us have a lot of words. So how are you, you know, thinking about that literacy part and addressing it? And then number two, kind of similar to just the last question, is there a way to align these expectations to surveys for teachers? So I can talk a little bit about the literacy thing. It's something that I'm always looking at as we um, we get to see all the questions ahead of time. That's the role of our committee is to sort of provide feedback at multiple points. And so we haven't seen them yet in science, but we just finished mathematics um, and English language arts and um, constantly trying to cut words out when we can't, when they're not there. We do, fortunately, as part of our um, uh, larger board, but particularly uh, they're all on assessment, the De assessment development committee have 
um, practicing teachers at the fourth, eighth, and 12th grade level. So they're really good at saying there's no way my kids could do that or know that. Um, additionally, so, but there's still a lot of reading, especially with the scenarios tax. And we've had a lot of conversations about that. Um, one thing that is available is that um, because this is not a reading test, the students can get the test. There's an option to have it read to them, right, Sharon? I'm not saying that wrong. Yeah. So they, if, they still have to be sort of fluent or at least proficient in English. It's not offered in multiple languages. But if they are not reading English, there's a little button that will read. they can press and it will read the question to them. So that is one accommodation that we have so far. But we do recognize that one of the big challenges of having these deeper, richer phenomena is that you have to describe them. And that mandates, in some ways, longer questions. To, to that end, there's also a recognition, at least on our board, which I think we have communicated um, onto the test developers that we can't completely move away from the shorter questions you saw, like the one about the dandelion, like there have to be some of those as well. They have to fit in with the new framework. They have to have two dimensions, but we still need to have some that don't involve the longer scenario for students who might just shut down if they see that much in front of them. So we are trying continually to think about, they're not, there's two, let, issues there. One is whether or not you can read English proficiently, which may have some may have to do with uh, academic achievement or may just have to do with what your first uh, language may be. So there, there is an overlap there, but try, always having those students in the back of our head that don't like to read. So we're aware of it. I'm not sure where we'll end up falling out on it, but it is something that uh, we know students can struggle with or shut down before so we're not accurately measuring what they actually know or measuring what they can read or are willing to listen to. Kevin? Thanks, James. Uh, with engineering part of the NRC science framework, I'm wondering about how that was thought of. And, and part of me assumes that because of the NAEP tell, it was not emphasized as much. And so a follow-up question there would be, you know, is there any future plans for the NAEP tell and any modifications to that given connections to the, the NRC framework? Oh, you are speaking my language. <laughs> engineering education is where I spend most of my time. Um, so the technology and engineering um, is following what was in the framework. So there'll be um, the concepts that are relevant to science achievement will be integrated into the updated science and engineering practices. There will be uh, spaces in the um, current assessment. Um, right now, the tell has been put on hold indefinitely. So don't expect, uh, let's just say, don't hold your breath that that's coming back. That is an extraordinarily expensive exam. Um, is part of the reason, like it's really expensive. So um, that's it's not shuttered yet, but it's on indefinite hold. So um, there is a special study going on. Um, I raised this issue of we don't have any way to report on engineering. And if we are asking engineering questions, couldn't we at least report on engineering? And so they've commissioned, uh, they have what we call special studies where folks go out um, and do sort of some research to figure out different directions. And there is one right now going on about engineering to ascertain whether they could in fact have as one of those things in addition to sense making in the three disciplinary areas is it possible with the uh design of the test to do in an engineering and this gets into all kinds of psychometric stuff i won't pretend to understand but you have to have a certain um number of items in order to be able to pull those exams so i am um hoping <laughs> that will that that will be able to come through it's um uh, you know a little bit uh, disappointing not to have engineering more robustly on the exams, but frankly, it also follows what's happening in many of the states. So it's not completely surprising. So we'll continue to push on that as we can. Um, and hopefully the special study will find that there's some way to provide some measure of what students are thinking about or pull out the questions that are engineering and technology related, but it will not look like tell. Tell was a literacy, um, a sort of a more literacy based thing. Like, what do you know about technology? How can you use technology? And this exam is not literacy. It's much more about science and engineering sort of achievement. So there will be that difference as well. Um, any other questions from the group? Got one more if nobody has one. So Christine, let me, let me put you on the spot for a minute and say, if you could change anything in the statute with regard to science, what would you, what would you prefer to be changed? Yeah, um, I think this goes back to the question that Heath asked very early in about how do you... Um, how do you get the same access that you have for the other subjects? I would love to see science um, at the same level, which basically comes down always to funding 
as the math and reading. So could you could we have it every two years and could we have it at every grade level? Because right now we're down to just one grade level, which is grade only grade eight. Um, and if I could change anything about the statue overall for NAEP, I would say that it would be really um, beneficial, I think, if in addition to having national and some district scores, if there were sort of, um, you know, a bigger emphasis in science, we can't even get district level data. We only have national data. So if there was a way of getting state, I'm sorry, we can't get state level data. If we could get state level data for science, I think that would also um, be helpful because I know at the, what I observe around the math and the um, reading framework is that states actually pay attention to those and they look at other states and they put themselves on various um, levels and they actually try to do something to raise those scores. And because we don't have state level um, scores for science, you can't have those conversations. There's no pressure to really do anything because it's just a national um it's a national sort of dipstick about where we are as as a country. And so if I had all the money in the world coming from the science part, that's where I would encourage the legislation to change. If we really care about science, then we need to elevate it to be at that same level. You know, I'm going to turn that into a clip, right? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> no, I, pre I appreciate the discussion, right? That's something we've advocated for really strongly. Can I ask? Um, uh, sure, go ahead, Jeremy. Um, my apologies for uh, jumping in. Um, I spent last week um, in Florida um, at the Florida Science uh, Supervisors um, Conference, and there was a large focus around um, virtual schools and virtual uh, sciences um, to the point to where it, they um, they kind of blew you off to the point to where they wouldn't discuss anything uh, or physical equipment with you um, whatsoever in regards to the sciences, um, because they are, are coming and designing programs around virtual schools. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing that a lot nationally and how is the assessments gonna be uh, measured to show the actual physical labs and physical equipment in the schools and the results of that testing um, for those students uh, with the virtual schools. That's a really interesting question. I know Florida is up there in, it's a, in across the nation. I think Pennsylvania, which is my home state, also it does pretty well. It holds its own on virtual schooling, but it's not Florida levels yet. I don't know if we ask questions on our, that would be a, like a contextual level or a sampling level. I know we are, we can, we don't get to sample every single school in the country, like private schools can opt in or they don't have to opt in, but because they're not getting federal funding, the participation is actually fairly low outside of Catholic schools. Um, and so when you have these virtual, like if they're public schools and they're bound and they're getting public money, um, we would sample those students. But if they're outside of that, if they're you know private schools or um, even some kinds of charters, it depends upon the charter school, like we wouldn't even capture those kids, which I think is another thing I have. A, if I were another thing I were to change about the legislation, it would be that you know, every kid has to take this exam. I don't care if you're homeschooled. That's actually specifically prohibited in the current legislation um, or private school. Like there's there's should, should be every kid. So we understand and can compare. Um, I don't but I, it would be a, it would be an interesting question. I'm going to go and see. Um, do we ask the kids where they're going? Oh, Sharon's saying there needs to be a physical location that we need to come for the assessment that we can't they can't take it from home. So any kid that's enrolled entirely in virtual school unless they come once in a while somewhere is, is not taking the NAEP exam. So we're not even picking those kids up, which also becomes problematic because like, again, there's no way to sort of um, show the differences or the outcomes of these different kinds of schooling if you're only capturing, or you're primarily capturing you know, public school kids who come to school. And I do think that is a, something that we need to think about as a nation, particularly as more and more kids are moving into other kinds of spaces. Um, there's just no way of comparing what those kids are doing, but it is it is challenging. And I think, well, we'll see what the NAEP 2024 results are. But I suspect, given that these are kids who have been through the pandemic, um, that like every other assessment we've had, they're not going to be very, the, the scores will go down. Um, but that is a good question. Great question, Jeremy. We've got time for one last question. Did I hear somebody else? All right. Well, with that, let me let me thank our two guests today. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham, Dr. Rosenberg. Really appreciated this. 
Um, appreciated the re the resources on this. I, I you know one of the things just to tee this up. I think we'd like to come back to you and see if we might do a version of this kind of a briefing on NAEP science for a Capitol Hill audience. It's something we also do. I think you'd be you know some excellent panelists to just talk about this because I don't think there's a huge awareness of what where where NAEP science sits within the ecosystem of the rest of the NAEP universe and like hearing some of the things that you talked about, about the fact that that there is an economy of scale and that there's a willingness amongst NAGB members to you maybe do science on a more regular scale. And, and also the fact that it's an inventory of school conditions to some extent is, uh, those are all kind of helpful salient features that I think would be really nice to help communicate to the, to the other, the other branch of government. So appreciated your time. And let me just say a final thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.